And welcome back to Meeting of the Minds. Today I'm here with the great Robert Bennett, expert, you name it, he's got it. He's here to give us some great information on geocentrism, on the Catholic Church, on history. Like I said, he's our man. He's the scholar of the night. So Robert, thank you for joining us. Oh, great to be here. And I don't know about the great part. <laughs> Uh, so I, I first learned about you when you were on Tim Flanders' show, The Meaning of Catholic. I loved your show, and I said, man, it would be great if I was able to have you on my show one day. So it's a, it's, it's a great thing. I'm happy to have you with me. Great. Here I am. All right. So let's, let's take it from the top. Let's start off with everything, a historical perspective. Okay. The, uh, the clash between geocentrism and heliocentrism really goes back to to the beginning of the Christian era, when uh, when everyone believed, both in science and in the church, that the earth was the center of the universe. So that was true for mm, 15 centuries until the 1500s. Uh, why did science believe in this? Well, that was the observation that you make with your own senses. Your eyes tell you that Everything moves through the sky, and the Earth seems to be at, at rest. So no problem with science. And with scripture, we have the testimony that I'll go through in detail later, which describes the, uh, the foundation of um, geocentrism. So if, if this is a perspective, we should think of what happened in, after 15 centuries to change uh, the, the mind of science. So what we have is um, in the first century AD, a model which was proposed by Ptolemaeus, an Egyptian. And what he did was propose a model that shows the earth in the center of the universe. And his model showed every object in the universe um, over the the uh, earth and right here right what we have up on the screen you got it, it that's okay. it and that's the so-called ptolemaic model now that uh, was what was proposed to uh, be a model of what you would uh, actually see in the geocentric model if you were on earth as we are and I'll go into that in detail later. Now, Galileo uh, was both a Catholic and a scientist. And at, at his time, there was a book proposed by Copernicus, a monk, which proposed that the earth was uh, not at the center, the sun was. So this is a heliocentric model proposed by the monk Copernicus. And it, it established uh, but he proposed that it showed that the earth, that the church was wrong, that we didn't have um, a geocentric universe. We had a heliocentric. This is where physics challenged um, the geocentric theory for the first time. Three centuries later, Darwin would, would uh, challenge the, uh, the, the book of Genesis, that is, challenge scripture with its proposal of evolution. And so that's what we've had, a basic breakdown in the agreement between science and scripture, first in the 15th century, based on geocentrism. Three centuries later, we've had the break in biology with Darwin. And then I'll cover what modern uh, theories are later. Okay, so the, the basic uh, problem is that there is a false belief in this separation that occurred in the 15th century. And that's what I'm going to cover in this talk. Okay? Excellent. Excellent. Uh, so we'll, we'll get our distinctions on the record? Right. Let's look at the knowledge domains. I think that's the first slide. Okay, one of the things that's missing in science 
is a firm foundation in knowing what is truth. It's called epistemology. In the first column, you see what Catholics believe. First of all, they believe in the primacy of truth coming from God himself, which is theology. And I have to distinguish here that it's pre that too that I'm talking about, because there has been some wanderings and deviations from uh, what Catholic belief is since, uh, let's say, the 1960s. Now, what's, what's based on Catholic theology is a philosophy called scholasticism, which was a modification of Aristotle's beliefs to agree with Catholic beliefs. It was done by Aquinas and St. Bonaventure in the 15th century, which is uh, the same century in which the Galileo uh, affair took place. So we have a lot of things happening in the 15th century. The next source of truth is science based on realism. Realism, as the note shows below, is a belief in objective reality. You believe in things that uh, you see based on uh, your senses. And the senses are reliable as regards their proper object. That means your eyes are, are reliable in seeing the world and they testify correctly to the, to the mind. The opposite of this would be idealism where the world is like a dream. It's like the, uh, the uh, drama, the matrix, where you're in a computer generated world. So we believe in objective reality, not idealism that the senses are reliable. We believe in causality. We believe that every effect has a cause. And more than that, we believe that there is sufficient cause for every effect. That is, something cannot produce something else unless it itself has the ability to do that. This is called sufficient causality or nemo dat quad non habit. That's Latin for Nothing can give what it doesn't have. Then we have um, sequiturs and non sequiturs. Non sequiturs are not are contradictions. So if something is said to be A and not A at the same time in the same meaning, that's a non sequitur. That's a violation of the principle of non contradiction. There are many other laws, but that's basically the foundation of realism or scholasticism. Then finally, the source of truth is science or specifically in this case, physics. So notice the hierarchy. We believe in the theology first because the highest authority is God. Then we go through our experience, philosophy, and we go through taking, taking experiments, which is science. Mainstream science, MS science, considers that physics is the pyramid of the uh, hierarchy of truth. In, in uh, mainstream science, physics is the uh, final authority. Physics, of course, is a branch of science. And the philosophy that underlies science is materialism. So it excludes right from the beginning any belief in immaterial substance and, or spirituality. That, that is the basis of mo modern uh, science. There is no real philosophy except materialism in mainstream science. The philosophy that they have is um, based on atheism, agnosticism, nihilism. In fact, if I ask some, some of the people I know, some of the uh, mainstream scientists, their reaction to, to philosophy is, I don't need any stinking philosophy, right? They discount philosophy at all. And that's a contradiction because philosophy is a, uh, a worldview. It's a way of looking at the world and predicting what will happen. It's your model, if you want, in your mind of how the world works. So if they say they have no philosophy, well, that is a worldview. So they do have a philosophy. So right away you have a contradiction. 
Okay, that's basically basically the the uh, the summary. One Let's one question with that. With um, we look at Immanuel Kant, how he is he basically I guess he postulated that we can't know anything for sure. Is that true? We can't, or our senses are not reliable. Maybe that's the right way to put it. Yeah, that's that's basically it. It's the that philosophy is really really nihilism that you can't know anything. Atheism is that there is no God. Agnosticism is that you can't know everything, and nihilism is that you can't know anything. Okay, so it it's a philosophy of knowledge which contradicts itself because it says it can't know anything. And interestingly, he's the father of modern cosmology, correct? He's the father of cosmology, they call him? <laughs> well, that could be. Um, <laughs> I haven't heard that term used for, for uh, Immanuel Kant, but uh, I guess it all, it all depends on how you uh, consider his philosophy linking to modern philosophy. Okay. Uh, all right, go ahead. So now we're on okay. to we're on to scripture and geocentrism. Right. What does the Bible say about so this? So we're going to break this up into what does scripture say about geocentrism? What does science say about geocentrism? Well, Genesis says right away there's a con contradiction because the earth was made on day one and the sun was made on day four. So heliocentrism couldn't possibly have been the, the model of the universe. Yeah, according to uh, Genesis. Geocentrism is supported by more than 30 verses, which are actually geostatic. That's what GS means. Geostatic means the earth is at rest. It doesn't move. And geocentrism means that the earth is the center of the universe and everything rotates around it. Scripture actually says in its 30 verses that the earth is geostatic. There are no verses that say it's heliocentric. So by either direct or indirect description, we have um, support, total support for geostatism. And from now on, Gene, I'm gonna call it geocentrism and not, not to uh, confuse the two, but uh, most people are familiar with geocentrism. So there's a verse in scripture which says the, uh, the earth is fixed on its foundation, it cannot be moved. I think it's in Proverbs. So there's a direct indication of the fact that the earth isn't moving. There's also verses that say the sun rises or sets, the moon rises or sets. That's another indication uh, that indirectly the earth is not moving. So you can't find anything in scripture that says the uh, Earth is moving. All right, I think we can go go on to the next. All right, the Ptolemaic model, which again was considered valid for 15 centuries because it was written by the Egyptian in the first century uh, AD. All celestial objects surround the Earth in, in circular orbits. So if we look at the model, we see that the Earth uh, is surrounded by first the moon, the first orbit moon, then Mercury and Venus. Now the normal model is that Venus and Mercury orbit the sun, not the Earth. But the Ptolemaic model says that the, uh, those two planets orbit the, uh, the Earth. Then we have the sun and the planets that were known at that time. Where are the uh, outer planets? Well, remember the, the telescope was just invented at this time. So these are still naked eye observations of the heavens. And that's why you don't see the outer planets. Okay, so this is what was proposed, as I said, for 15 centuries. It's simple. Nothing could be simpler than putting everything that we see in a circular orbit around the Earth. But it's complex to compute because there are what are called deviations in that circular motion. I cover that, by the way, 
in the um, video presentation that you mentioned that um, I gave to Tim Flanders on meaning of Catholic. So a lot of this is on that video, but I'm summarizing it uh, so that we can get to the, uh, the modern view of geocentrism. Okay, if you scroll up a little, the conflict between geocentrism and heliocentrism. There's a challenge given to uh, the belief in the Bible by the Protestant rebellion, because what we had there was a personal and a literal or non-literal interpretations of the Bible. And so if you allow that, then geocentrism can be challenged according to the personal belief in whoever read the scripture and their personal interpretation. So belief in the magisterium as the definer and translator of scripture is a key part of understanding geocentrism. Now, what is the science challenge to, uh, to geocentrism? Galileo's observations through the telescope contradicted the Ptolemy model. First of all, Galileo saw Jupiter's moons. Now, the Ptolemy model said that all the moons go around the Earth in their own orbit. This observation shows that the moons that he saw went around Jupiter, not around Earth. So that's a, con a contradiction with Ptolemy model. The moon has phases, as we know, every 28 days, uh, the illuminated side changes. Venus has ch also has phases, and those also are contradicted by the Ptolemy model. Mars and Jupiter, in the course of a year, sometimes stop and even go backwards called retrograde motion. This is also contrary to the Ptolemy model. So Galileo is using the scientific method and it is valid. These are contradictions to the, the Ptolemy method, which is the model of uh, geocentrism. But the question, Gene, is, is the error that he's finding in the geocentric theory itself or in the model that Ptolemy provided. So that's what we'll explore on the next page. Makes sense. All right, the Copernican model. Okay, we talked about this, but here's the visual for it. This should be familiar to everyone. This is the modern view of the heliocentric model which was uh, first proposed by Copernicus back in the 1500s. Okay, you have the sun at the center, and then all of the planets are centered on the sun, and the Earth has its moon. The other moons hadn't been seen. Mars has two, Jupiter has many, and Saturn, but they're not visible because, again, this is the 1500s, and astronomy was just in its infancy, really. Now look, look for, the further, for future notice, look at the moon. Does the moon go around the sun in this model? No, it goes around the earth. This is claimed to be a heliocentric model, but it doesn't follow the model of um, Ptolemy. The moon would go around the sun if it followed that model. So in this uh, case, we have a clue to the solution of solving the Ptolemy model. And that's the modern model, even it's 500 years old. Now there's a conflict between GC and HC, obviously. Galileo's observations contradicted Ptolemy. Uh, and now we will consider the church's response to Galileo. What did the church say about uh, Galileo's uh, observations. Well, St. Robert, uh, St. Robert Bellarmine wrote a letter to Father Foscarini. It's a famous letter. St. Robert Bellarmine is many things. He's um, 
a defender of the faith. He's an advisor to Pope Urban. He is uh, a saint, obviously. He was a cardinal at that time. And uh, he is uh, part of the council, the holy office as it's called, that will investigate the claims of Galileo. So in this letter, what does Father uh, St. Robert say? He's a doctor of the church, by the way, uh, one of his many titles. He said, it's okay if heliocentrism is considered to be a computational model, but not if you consider its reality. What he's saying is, if I use a slide rule or a calculator to do math, okay, well, that's using uh, something to simplify what I could do in my head, but I'd rather do it and sit with a simplified model, like a calculator. Well, the same thing holds for uh, heliocentrism. Copernicus model can be used if you consider that it's not the true model of the universe, but it's helpful in understanding how the, how the cosmos moves. Number two, the magisterium and the fathers demand a literal interpretation. So if we deny that the 30 verses are true, which say that the earth is at rest, then that denial would deny basically all of it. One way of putting it would be, it's letting the camel's nose under the tent, which is the way they used to say that you're letting in error uh, get into the uh, body of truth. Now, the third thing that Bellman said was, if heliocentrism was true, then the biblical meaning has been misunderstood. That is, what we read is not what the Bible meant. And that's certainly possible because we're human. However, Bellman points out, no one has shown that heliocentrism is true. The relative moments between all of the objects in the cosmos show that either GC or HC could be true. Either one could be true because it's only relative motions between them that are measured. It's holy writ that says that it's only geocentrism that represents reality. So if you have a ship and a shore, uh, a ship passing along a shore, if you're on the ship, you can have the apparent um, belief that the shore is moving because that's what you'll measure, okay? But we know that the true motion is relative to the shore, not relative to the ship. And the Bible says that uh, what we see from earth is reality. You should insert the word from earth in there. Bible says what we see from earth is reality. Is reality. Okay. And now one of the okay. one of the, some Move of the on. things that you some of the things you hear from people nowadays is you hear um, there's a literal translation of the Bible and literalistic. Is that just an excuse people use to kind of make up their own thing? That's how I've heard it explained that if you were especially relating to Genesis and the flood and creation, that if the Bible says it's raining cats and dogs, it's not literalistically raining cats and dogs. The literal meaning is what's the author trying to convey? So is that just opening up the door for the camel to stick its nose under the tent? Yes, basically. Uh, the resolution of all these things uh, is the verse we're looking at, uh, an analog. Uh, is It uh, has a spiritual meaning, not a physical meaning, etc. All of this, when there are issues involved, involving interpretation, should be resolved by the Masirian. That is the, uh, the ultimate authority. Uh, you yes. use the word literalistic. I'm not familiar with that. Literal means to take the words as they normally mean uh, and not try to extend them to, uh, to uh, areas where they, they don't belong. Okay. And then one other thing I heard from 
uh, the Thomistic Evolution guys. There's a group of um, Dominican priests. Seems like they're well-meaning. They try to push evolution and saying that it's in line with Scripture. One of the big hinge points for their argument is they say Genesis 1 and Genesis 2 have a slightly different order of creation. It's men, then animals, then women. And then the other the other chapter says, um, I guess, animals, then men, then women, something along those lines. And they they hinge their argument saying, if the order is different, then clearly it's not to be taken literal. Otherwise, we have a contradiction and the word of God can't contradict itself. So therefore, this must be symbolic. How do we respond to that? Well, it's interesting that you should bring that up because that is a uh a future topic, which would fill, okay. uh, which would fill an hour, but <laughs> let me give you uh, the quick and dirty uh, resolution from, in my humble opinion. Okay. If you apply the um, scholastic concept of holomorphism to Genesis, which means that uh, reality is created by um, the activation of different forms or uh, forms acting on prime matter, okay? Prime matter is, is matter without any characteristics, all right? It's, so think of the matter as being uh, a blob which has no color, no, no, nothing that you can sense until it is informed by uh, a, a, a form, a substantial form, and consider that scripture is describing in the first day, the creation of forms, okay? That is the models for all future uh, species, uh, man included, all the animals, the plants and everything else first um, are created in a model, which is a description of what they will be, all of their characteristics or their qualities. On the second day, we have, we have a description of the activation of those forms in, into the actual creation of the, the plants, the animals, and so on, it, up to the sixth day of um, man. So there's no contradiction. We have creation occurring in steps. First, the creation of forms, and then the forms do not create new things because creation refers specifically to uh, going from nothing to something. That's creation. When you go from one form to another or one, uh, one being to another, that's change. Or, and that's explained by holomorphism. So what I'm saying is the first day is the creation of forms in the scholastic model and the second day is the creation, the direct creation, or the change rather, from the form to the instantiation, to the, cre to the I keep saying change, instantiation of the, uh, of the, the uh, so I'll explain all of the people who were uh, existing after Adam and Eve, they came from the forms that were created on the first day. Okay, okay, or, excellent. Not, not the first day, the first uh, chapter, first chapter of Genesis. Right, right. Okay, excellent. So we'll move it, moving on along, Einstein. Let's hear about Einstein. Okay, Einstein we'll talk about later. Relativity says that either the ship or the shore can be measured at rest. So you could take either point of view, okay? So Einstein would agree with, well, he would disagree with anyone who says, heliocentric or geocentric, right? Because geocentric, you're saying only the earth can be used for measuring, no? And those who say heliocentric, same thing. They're saying only the sun can be used. So Einstein contradicts both of them by saying in relativity, either one can be used. You can measure motion if you're on the ship or you're on shore. Now, what is Bellarmine's point? Well, if we doubt the validity of something so fundamental like geocentrism, I mean, it's clear that that's what the, the whole book of scripture um, describes. How can it be unreasonable to then doubt it all? Okay, if we let one 
thing, uh, one part of it, uh, scripture be an error, then all of it could possibly be an error. So at the Holy Office trial, Galileo was suspected of heresy, okay? Suspected of heresy. So at that time, it's clear that if you believed in heliocentrism, you were a heretic, or at least suspected of being one. Now, what did the office say? They said that the sun is, the sun is in the center of the world and immovable is, a, is an absurd concept, philosophically false and formally her heretical. So if you believe in heliocentrism, you are, you are a formal heretic. They didn't say the same thing about saying that the earth is not the center of the world. That is denying that the earth is geos that the world is geocentric or that it's geostatic. They said that that's absurd, philosophically false and erroneous in faith, okay? But not necessarily heretical. So they made a, a distinction there. Okay, let's look at the, um, the contest between the two centrisms from the scientific side. Almost 20 to 30 years after Copernicus uh, produced his model, uh, a, an astronomer named Tycho Brahe produced the Tychonian model. And what that consisted of was a hierarchy of uh, views, which shows the planets orbiting the sun, but the sun itself orbiting the earth. In fact, the first level as it's called is the sun and moon and stars orbit the earth, which is shown in the diagram. Then the second level is the planets and comets and asteroids orbit the sun, and then in the third level, the moons orbit the planets. So it's called a hierarchical or leveled model. And we saw that, didn't we, in the, in the Copernicus model. It was snuck in there because the moon is a level two. Okay, it, the moon doesn't go around the sun. Now, don't be confused by that diagram. It seems like the sun is at the center, right? Visually. It looks like it's in the center. But actually, if everything was moving, you would see the sun move around the earth uh, and the moon. And at the same time, all the planets would be moving around the sun. So if you want, where it says earth, imagine that that's at the center rather than visually seeing the sun at the center. Okay, so. This is the Tychonian model, and guess what? It resolves all of the Galileo issues, all right? All those things that I said uh, were valid scientific objections, all of them can be shown to be, uh, uh, they can be rejected. In fact, the Tychonian model shows that you have an exact you have the same model basically, but viewed from the earth or from the sun. If you view it from the sun, it's called Copernicus. If you view it from the earth, it's called the Tychonian model. Okay, and you can show by doing mathematical transformations, no mathematician would argue with this, that the Tychonian model shows the correct motion of the heavens. Now, this is a this is a model that you probably never heard of. Even when I was studying physics, I never heard of the Tychonian model because I was educated, of course, in mainstream science beliefs. And that, that brought me to um, eventually the conflict with religion, with the scriptures. And after investigation, I found out by digging deep into history, you can find the Tychonian model but it is ignored in modern textbooks. Now, I guess a lot of people are gonna ask why. Yeah, well, if we accepted the Tychonian model, which is a valid geocentric model, then we'd have to go turn the clock back to, to the 1500s and say, hey, we rejected, we rejected the geocentric model because it didn't, Ptolemy's model didn't uh, obey it, but now it does. So maybe G 
geocentrism is right. In fact, we can't prove it's wrong. And that means, well, maybe the uh, spiritual world described in scripture, maybe that's correct. In other words, it's the conflict between the secular world of materialism, which is your underlying philosophy. It, it guides you in how you think versus the, the open um, scholastic uh, model of realism and based on theology. So it really comes down to fear. They're just afraid that if, if the earth is the center of the universe, what else might be true? Yes. Isn't that interesting? Fear gov governs, right? Fear that's not expressed, but it's sort of a wink and nod. If you have a meeting of scientists, you know, they'll basically agree on heliocentrism, although, as I'll point out, uh, relativity uh, this, uh, rejects the, the concept of any object being at the center because everything can be used relatively. Everything can be measured relatively. Right. So it sounds like they're going to dogmatically and religiously hold to the position that the earth is not the center of the universe. Yes. This becomes scientific dogma. Yes. Okay. If, if there were such a thing. <laughs> okay. Well, we have that in, uh, we have this in modern politics too, but we won't get into that. <laughs> no scientific arguments or experiments have ever refuted this model. Okay. Of Brahe. Why haven't you heard about it? Well, we've just discussed one of the reasons why. Now, it's interesting. We have people who say, who are Catholic, that geocentrism is not a belief of the church. Well, I would point out that we have beliefs like um, artificial contraception, okay, which are definitely dogmatic, and abortion. The, the laws against abortion. Those are ignored, I would say, by possibly half of the so-called believers. So you have a lot of doctrine of the church it, that doesn't find its way into the belief of the common person. And geocentrism is just an exaggerated example of something that is almost universally uh, rejected even though there is no way to prove that it's false, either scientifically or uh, religiously through scripture. And sadly, growing up, the only people I've really seen cling to this belief were um, only some fundamentalist Protestants. So they were. it's interesting that they were wrong about a lot of the faith, but maybe this one part, they happened to cling to the the traditional teachings of the Catholic Church better than the Catholic Church clung to those teachings. Yes. Because uh, yes, it's not sir. a Protestant belief, it's a Catholic belief. Yeah, it's a belief in Scripture as written. Right. Basically, Th those Protestant sects that believe in a literal translation have to come to a conclusion that it's geocentric. Right. Okay, so the Church never, um, retracted the Galilean edicts, the ones that I read to you from the Holy Office, okay? Although many people think that's been done, all right? To this, to this day, it's an invisible part of the deposit of faith. That is, it's not practiced, but it's present. Okay, let's look now at the modern era. We have, in this case, I want to prove that the earth moves, okay? Scientists asked the same question in the 1800s. In 1886, Michelson and Morley did a famous test, whether the earth moves through this ether. Now, what is the ether? The ether is the substance that we can't see that fills all space and it provides the medium in which light moves. Now we know that waves in water require water to move and Extending that concept, the physicists agree that if you have light waving, that there must be something that's waving. And that something is called ether. Ether also appears in the scripture as the firmament. Okay. And we could have a whole hour discussion about the firmament and uh, which is the scriptural 
uh, description of, of ether. But let's go to the Michelson-Morley test. What are they testing for? Well, think if you were in a car and you roll down the windows and put your hand out, you could tell whether you were moving by the wind that you would feel on your hand. Okay, in this case, the hand would be the detector of motion. Okay, so Michelson Morley said, okay, if the Earth's going around the sun, at one time it should be moving through the ether in one direction, and then six months later, remember this is the heliocentric model, six months later it'd be moving in the other direction. So there must be a difference between the two because if you're moving through even stationary ether, the, the wind would be detected in opposite directions. All right, so they, they wanted to know how fast is the earth moving through the ether? And they did the test using an interferometer, which is the same as the hand outside the car window. It's a device to measure the speed of light. And they found that there was no difference so what would you say, Gene, if in that car model, you stuck your hand out the window and you found out that there was no wind? What would your conclusion be? I would assume that I'm not moving. That's it. Common sense, the earth isn't moving, okay? Now you have just indicated logic, but what would happen if you said the earth isn't moving? Well, then you'd be saying it's geocentric and then we're going back to the conflict, the Galilean conflict, and we're saying that uh, the Earth possibly is not, uh, is at rest rather, and it is not moving. But what did mainstream physics and Einstein said? To resolve the issue, they said there's no ether. That's why you don't find it. But if there's no ether, light can't move through nothing right, through empty space, we have starlight coming when sunlight and all the light that we get from the heavens comes through empty space. But the space isn't really empty. It's got ether, this invisible substance, which is equivalent to, uh, as I said, the firmament. Okay, it's like saying in the car model, well, there is no air. That's the reason that you don't feel any wind. And that contradicts logic because we know that there's, there's air for, because <laughs> we'd suffocate without it. Okay, the response is that uh, from the mainstream is it, it, ideology trumps truth. We're going back, in other words, to the conflict between science and, uh, and the church. Okay, let's scroll down. So if relativity allows Earth to be the measuring frame at rest, then why does mainstream physics insist that the Earth orbits the sun? This is one of many conflicts, many contradictions. If you can choose anything you want to be the frame at rest, and that means including the Earth, then why don't you allow a geocentric model? Again, it, it's all basically religious. It's all based on the conflict between materialism and spiritualism. Okay, let's look at the scientific resolution of this problem. Many people don't know this, but physics is broken up into two branches. Kinematics, which is purely mathematics applied to science. It's the science of measurement. So if you measure distance, velocity, acceleration, all right, different properties of motion, then you're doing kinematics. Relativity is only valid for measurements. And I give examples there of different relative motions. Another branch of physics is dynamics. Dynamics is the study of predicted future motion. Notice that I underline that. Kinematics is the science of measurement. Dynamics is the study of predicted future motion. So in order to find out how fast something is moving, I can measure it. 
Okay, that's one option. That's kinematics. Or I can use the values of um, force and mass and other properties to predict what the value will be before I measure it. So this is prediction of the future. This is obviously what you must have to do rocket launches, to do trips to the International Space Station, to the moon, and so on. So this is dynamics. It uses the energy concept to determine equations of motion, the laws of physics. Now, general relativity says that there is a principle called general covariance. Don't be scared by the name. Law of motion, the laws of motion and dynamics are valid for all observers. So you can use the laws of physics to predict motion according to general covariance, which is what Einstein believed in his general theory, to predict what will happen no matter how you are moving. If you're on Earth, if you're on a plane, a train, if you're on the space station, if you're on the moon, no matter where you are, the laws of physics are valid. I'm going to give you a simple example to show that, that that's totally false. And it's, I call it the hitchhiker paradox. Okay, It's based on a specific um, law of motion, Newton's second law. The acceleration of an object is proportional to the force applied divided by the mass of the object being accelerated. In other words, the more push or pull you exert on an object, the faster it will change its velocity. However, the bigger the mass is, the more massive, more, more uh, matter it contains, the slower, the less acceleration it will have. This is a dynamic law. If you ask me what is the kinematic law for acceleration, it's the change of velocity over the change in time. Okay, so notice I can predict uh, acceleration with F equals, excuse me, yeah, F equals MA or A equals F over M, Newton's second law. Or I can use kinematics and measure the change in velocity over the change in time, which is acceleration. All right, we're gonna take the point of view of the hitchhiker, which is shown in this diagram. We have a car accelerating straight down a highway towards the hitchhiker. So accelerating again means moving at an increasing speed, not constant speed, changing speed. Okay, uh, next slide. This is the point of view of the driver. The driver sees the hitchhiker on the side of the road. The driver considers himself to be at rest. Okay, which we said is perfectly valid according to you, Einstein. And so what we have is the hitchhiker accelerating towards the car. If the car were going uh, south at 50 miles per hour, then the driver would see the hitchhiker moving north at 50 miles per hour. Okay, I'll call that the driver and the hiker reference frame, which is the same as the earth. Okay, so we have the driver heading north, he has a mass of mh, the h stands for the, hi uh, the hiker, and the m for the mass. The acceleration is ad, which is the acceleration of the driver. And the driver's mass is md. So those are the things that you can measure. In the hiker's frame, the hiker predicts the inertial force from Newton's second law is F equals MA, where this is applied to the driver. So we, all, we have all of the Ds. This predicts in common sense terms that the driver will feel um, a force on him as he's accelerating. So we know from common experience that this is true. When, you, when your car speeds up, you feel the force of the seat back on your back. And that's the, the acceleration called inertial force. And this formula predicts what that force will be. And it is measured with a spring scale and it turns out to be correct. So Newton's law applies in this case to 
the hitchhiker measuring the driver. Okay, now let's look at the driver frame. Okay, we're gonna do a little math because we have to. We have to show what, what the uh, driver uh, measures and what he predicts. The acceleration of the hiker is measured by the driver. Uh, we're looking for AH, the acceleration of the hiker as seen by the driver. This is a measurement, so kinematic supplies and relativity. So AH is equal and opposite to AD. The acceleration of the hitchhiker is equal and opposite to the drivers, okay? In this case, the, the uh, hiker would be moving south. Step number two, what is the inertial force, FH? That's the force on the hiker as predicted by the driver. Not measured, predicted. So we got to use dynamics, Newton's second law, F equals MA. And we can substitute for AH minus AD because the accelerations are equal and opposite from kinematics. And that's not zero. Okay, that's what the that's what the symbols mean, not equal. MH AD is not zero because neither M nor A is zero. But what is the measured force on the hiker? Well, here we draw on common sense. When a car accelerates past you on the highway, do you feel the acceleration, the same acceleration that the driver feels? No. No, you feel nothing. There is no inertial force on, on the hiker, even though the driver would predict it using Nick Newton's second law. So we know that the hiker feels no force from the accelerating car. So here is the conflict. We predict that there is a force on the hiker, just as it was on the driver, using Newton's second law. But the force on the hiker is zero when measured. Okay, we're not considering any of the wind that might, you know, influence the uh, the hiker as the car goes past. So the laws of physics, in this case, F equals ma, are only true predictions in the Earth or the lab frame. That's the only frame in which it, the laws of physics are valid. So now we have more confirmation that geocentrism is correct. The Lord God has made this world so that only on Earth are the laws of physics obeyed. If you are moving with respect to the earth in any way, and you try to use the laws of physics, you will fail. Now physicists know this, okay? And they call this fictitious forces. Well, I'll get to that. I'll get to that in a minute. So the high, why is the hiker um, able to make true predictions? Because he's in the earth frame. He's stationary on earth. Why can't the driver make good predictions with the laws of physics? Because he's not in the earth frame, okay? Anything else besides the earth frame, you cannot make dynamic predictions. Okay, let's go on. Okay, I'm just repeating in a simple way, Newton's bucket paradox. You can look that up. It's the first case in 1687 where this was noticed. Newton in the lab makes correct predictions of a rotating bucket, but if you were on the bucket, you would not make the correct predictions. All I did was simplify it, and everyone agrees uh, that the driver feels a force and the hitchhiker does not, even though they predicted the same force. Now, when I first heard this fictitious or fake forces, I thought it was hilarious. I heard this in uh, graduate school. I'm paying good tuition to go and listen to a, a teacher tell me that unless I'm on earth, everything that I try to predict is fictitious. I, I didn't pay tuition for fake physics. I wanted the truth. And the truth is that it's the earth. So to get around this gene to 
provide a subterfuge, right? That they, they do understand what's happening. They create this model that you are in a non-inertial frame. In other words, the earth is an inertial frame by definition because it obeys the laws of physics, but the car is not in an inertial frame. So they say, if you're not in an inertial frame, then you won't get the correct prediction. This is true. But what they leave out is that all reference frames are non-inertial, which are not earth frames. So any motion with respect to the earth is a non-inertial frame. So notice how they try to make it sound like there are another non-inertial frames besides the car. That's not true. The, uh, anything that moves with respect to the earth is a non-inertial frame. Okay, this has not been resolved. It's been uh, buried, ignored, Okay, but it is another proof of, of geocentrism. All right, so the evidence is that the laws of dynamics are true in the Earth's reference frame and only that frame. Any predictions uh, from the Earth frame will be valid. Others will be called fictitious or false. Okay, I would rather say all this is proving is that the Earth is a selected place in the universe where only the laws of physics are valid. Now, in order to distinguish this, which is a concept uh, which is ignored, at least till these modern days, think of the following. Kinematics, the branch of physics that does measurement, obeys relativity, okay? Dynamics, which is the part of physics that does prediction, predicts geocentrism. So you cannot use relativity in dynamics. That's the conclusion. And that's, that's the summary of all of the things that I just went through. As an epilogue, let's uh, use the, uh, the lab frame uh, for all applications of physical motion. That's the basic uh, conclusion. You know, Newton and Faraday and Maxwell and all of the great scientists of the past, they made their measurements on the Earth frame. And that's why it's always been assumed that in any other frame that the, um, the laws of physics would also be valid. That turns out to be incorrect. Okay, only from God's good green Earth can future motion on Earth and in the cosmos be truly predicted. So if you want to make predictions, you have to use uh, the Earth. Now, NASA will tell you, well, we make measurements from the spacecraft, and that determines what the spacecraft will do next. Yeah, but they've got ground tracking stations, and those ground tracking stations are the ones that determine what the laws of physics will be. Now, the viewer for this presentation probably uh, take it or leave it, basically, um, but you have a uh, choice to make. If this is the truth, what I've presented, that geocentrism is correct, then you have to believe and support the geocentric uh, truth as part of revealed truth, as part of the dogma of faith. Before this, you may have been in, had invincible in ignorance and not had any knowledge of geocentrism. But this makes the difference. I think there's another page with the future on it, Gene. Yes. Um, there's the uh, famous verse from Lowell, which applies here. All right, what are the remaining things that we should look at? Well, there's a conflict of um, with between Newton's law and geocentrism, how can the sun orbit the earth if Newton's laws of uh, uh, gravitation are valid? A smaller object should rotate or orbit uh, a larger object. So how can the sun orbit the earth? 
The quick answer is it's the motion of the ether that does it, but that requires a lot of explanation. And you have to talk about the role of firmament and ether in Genesis. Those are, that's another future topic. And then finally, we have the model of St. Hildegard, doctor of the church, who in the 12th century was given detailed information about spiritual things and also of the workings of the universe and including details of Genesis. It's amazing as I read through the research of St. Hildegard, how many different things I uh, discover. I just discovered yesterday that um, Lucifer and Satan are two different beings. Lucifer is condemned forever to hell where he was cast by St. Michael. Satan is an underling. He is a, a, a demon who is sent by Lucifer into the, uh, the world that we live in, the real world. And that's just one example of uh, what was revealed to, uh, to Hildegard. I don't know if you can see this on the screen. This is the book. Uh, no, not in the small. What's the name? Maybe I could pull it up on Amazon. I could share the screen. It's on Colby Center. The Colby true Center. conception of the world. The true conception of the world. Okay. Uh, it's translated by Dean Kenyon, but it's according to Hildegard von Bingen from Bingen, Germany. And if anybody wants to know all the details of geocentrism, Galileo was wrong. Excellent. <laughs> That's right. Anyway. Excellent. Okay. You can get that at GalileoWasWrong.com, Bob's and Genesis uh, website. Excellent. We're going to make sure we throw those links in the show notes. Okay. I, th I thought that was great, Robert. And I started fumbling around my notes here because I wanted to follow up on, on what you said right there about how the average person in the pew, they might be blissfully ignorant. But then once you're presented with this information, particularly compelling that all the fathers believed that the earth was at rest and at the center of the universe and a literal translation of Genesis. And in my notes here, I have from the Council of Trent that says, no one may dare. This is in um, Denzinger Hunemann in uh, 1507 for those who like the references but this is the council of trent that says that no one may dare to interpret scripture in a way contrary to the unanimous consent of the fathers so that's the council of trent we see it again in vatican one and i believe i think one of pope pius the tenth and pope pius the twelfth i'm probably missing others too not that we need the others once you hear it in the council of trent but it's right there so now people have a decision to make what are you going to do? Are you going to stay with the Catholic Church or turn away? And I love how you present the, the Tyconian model of the universe. I never heard of that, and I didn't know that was an alternative. So people can, it seems like we can hang our hat on that, correct? Yes, for the, for the motion. That is to explain why Galileo's objections, which are valid, are false, uh, or should be rejected for the Italian model, but not for the Tycone. It takes care of everything. <laughs> Excellent. Oh, great stuff. I would love to. I would love to do another one talking about several several of these topics and, and Saint Hildegard. That'd be great. I have not dove into that at all, but it sounds very interesting. Yes, yeah, she's written three books that I'm using. Uh, some books uh, don't deal with science; they purely spiritual. Some are um, with biology or what we would call the, um, um, not, I, I forget the word. Uh, anyway, the, the, the science of using plants for uh, curing diseases, okay? Natural, natural uh, laws used to, uh, to uh, solve problems. Uh, diseases and so on. But I, there are three books that uh, I'm using and I'm researching right now, and I'll try to put together a presentation. It is really fascinating to see what she, uh, what vision she got 
And remember, she is a doctor of the church, recently canonized, and so uh, her visions are approved for, right. uh, for Catholics. Right, and as we said before, why are they approved? Because they check out with the, <laughs> the historical, the traditional teachings of the Catholic Church. A lot of people take different private rev uh, revelation and they say, well, this proves it. Well, no, the, the magisterium sets the tone and clarifies and defines the teaching. And then these private revelations just add the support. I don't know if you'd call it added support, but it just um, it shows that and God reveals that because that's the way it was done. So that's great stuff. Yeah, Excellent. This, that goes back to the difference between the way the Catholics have an epistemology, which starts with theology. And the last thing we use is science. So right. everything has to check out from the top. Theology, right. philosophy, scholasticism, and then down to science. What does science do? They say science is king. Science is the source of truth. Philosophy, they usually ignore, or, or you, either though it's materialism. And that's, um, that's a difference. They have an upside down uh, epistemology. They use the wrong sequence for discovering truth. Excellent, excellent. We've come full circle. <laughs> Robert, thank you very much for your time. God bless you, God bless your family, great stuff. Likewise to you, Gene. Thanks, thanks for the opportunity. Absolutely. Take care. All right. Bye now. Bye.